Hello everyone and welcome to our Grand Round series. We have a very special guest today, a community partner from NICA, and they will be talking about housing insecurity, emergency rental assistance, and the presentation will be done by Epifania Adames. Good afternoon everyone, and welcome to our next Grand Round session. And I'm very excited about this session because this is our first community partner that we have for Grand Rounds. Um, and we know that during the pandemic, even prior to the pandemic, so our patients and our community have been struggling with housing insecurity. And this is a major problem in New York City, but not only in New York City, especially in the Bronx. So we felt that it was extremely important to to partner with organizations that can help our patients and our community through for rental uh, emergency rental assistance and eviction prevention, um, and really connect them with the help that they need. You know, we have great um, care coordination care coordinators and patient navigators that help through this process. But it's also important for us as a clinical community to really understand the resources that are out there for our community. So with great pleasure today, I have Epifania Adames, who is Assistant Director of Community Affairs for the Neighborhood Association for Intercultural Affairs. And she will be talking today about Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Thank you. Um, good afternoon and thank you for having me today. Um, it is with great pleasure that I'm here to give you this information and uh, to speak about our services. We are already uh, partnering with our transitional housing program side of NICA where um, you guys will be providing services to our uh, residents in our uh, shelter programs. But today I'm here to speak about our other services, which, is, which are uh, rental assistance. So as she said, my name is Epifania Adames, and I am the Assistant Director of the Community Affairs Department at Neighborhood Association for Intercultural Affairs, NICA. And this is my information, um, my phone number. Uh, if you need me, there are several agents here that have my information as well. So let me tell you a little bit about NICA. Uh, we are an organization, a non-for-profit organization that started in 1974 during the Bronx burnings. I don't know if you know about the Bronx burnings, but there was a time where buildings were burning and, and neighborhoods were falling apart, especially, and we were born to protect tenants at that time. Uh, we have a legal department that provide assistance since 1992. We have lawyers, and right now we have about 25 lawyers and 18 paralegals, and we pro and we uh, provide legal services to low, well, before the pandemic, only low income individuals, but now it's um, basically anyone that needs the help since the courts have changed their rules due to the pandemic. Now, if someone has a higher income, we are able to waive it through HRA so that we can assist. The courts right now are not providing any assistance to anyone that does not have a lawyer. So this is very important. So as I said, since 2017, we became part of the Universal Access for um, Council, which was an initiative that the courthouse created to provide uh, legal assistance to everyone. As most landlords go to court prepared with lawyers, we uh, the court wanted to make sure that tenants had the same fair chance. Even though they were not able to pay for it, we were there are several agencies that provide the services. 
throughout the city of New York. So what we do is that we provide legal services um, with all types of housing court cases. Basically, uh, Section 8 terminations, non-payments, which are when tenants owe money, that, that those cases are called non-payments. And then when a tenant is on a breach of their contract, it's called holdover. And this is another type of cases that we also provide help with. Um, let's say a holdover example would be um, they are making noise in the apartment, so the landlord takes them to court, or they didn't sign the lease, so the landlord takes them to court. There are anything that in the lease they're supposed to follow and they're in a breach of, the, uh, we help them fight for their apartments. Also, for we help with cases that have to do with repairs, building violations, as I said, Section 8 terminations. And our, our success rate is pretty high. We help at least 2,500 families per year. That's like the minimum families. And this is just the families that we get involved. We also provide free legal consultation to tenants that don't have a housing court case and they have questions about the lease or they have questions about different housing matters that may that they may have but they are not necessarily in court we have a hotline where they can call and get in touch directly with a lawyer that will give them access to uh, information that they may not know on their own um, so the Majesty Rental Assistance Program, the ERAP program for sure, it's an initiative that the city created, that, well, the state created to provide uh, relief to individuals and families that lost their income or had a hardship during the pandemic. This, um, this was for low income tenants, but in the, like, let's say by September, they started also helping people that were within the 80 and 120% AMI. Uh, this is a two um, a step application. The first, the first step is for the tenant to uh, completely fill out their application. And then the second step is for the landlord to fill out the part that belongs to them, which is basically um, information about their banking and all of that. But I'll get to that later. So this program pays 12 months of back rent uh, starting from March 2020. And then also they pay uh, three months of rent if the household pays 30% of their income in rent. So in total, what I've seen so far is that they pay 15 months worth of rent and utilities. So if the person wasn't able to also pay for electrical, they also help with that. Um, this money does not have to be paid back. The only time that this money has to be paid back is if there was fraud committed in the application process. So if they did not, if they lied about something and the city catches them, they may go after them and make, the pay, make them pay this money back. However, so far we haven't seen any cases like that. Um, the payments are made directly to the landlords, which is important for the tenants to have access to their information, such as their address, their name, and their phone number, so that the EDRAP can communicate with them to make sure that, they're, that they are completing their part of the application process. So, in January 15, all right, so this program is started in June 1st, 2021. And it was drastically closed in November 2021. So it only lasted for about six months, a little less. And the reason for that is because the city wanted to make sure that they had enough funding for the applications that were already submitted. So in order for them to make sure of that, they just uh, lacked the applications. However, these applications were reopened in January 2022 because the eviction moratorium was expired. So the eviction moratorium, um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. It started in 
uh, about April of 2020, and that was something that the, the, the courts started to protect tenants from evictions because we were in the middle of a pandemic. And this moratorium continued to be extended throughout the, throughout the months. Every couple of months, they will extend it again. It, would, it was supposed to be expired by August. They extended it until December. Then in December, they extended it until February. So they extended it because it was an unstable situation with, house, with the courts and housing and landlords who wanted to start evicting tenants, but it was a health hazard to have all of these tenants evicted going into the shelter system. Our shelters were overflowed. We had to get annex, um, we had to get annex uh, sites to be able to house more clients because homelessness was very hard. But during the time of COVID, you have homelessness, but also the issue with um, with we cannot have all these people all together in the same place so we had to get them separation rooms you know so and that side of our organization the transitional housing program side it was a challenge for us but at the same time it was a challenge for us in the legal side because we needed to protect tenants because we did not want more tenants going into the home into the shelter system um, because of that, the city decided once the moratorium expired that the next thing that they could do was to reopen the ERA program, but this time only to provide protection. So right now, currently, if you apply for the ERA program and you have a confirmation number, it's not necessarily for rental arrears, like you're not necessarily going to get this money, but you're getting protection. As long as the application is pending, the tenant cannot be evicted. That is basically the rule right now. And that was to be able to provide this protection because we are trying to avoid mass evictions in the city. Um, so as I said before, now the applications are open for people that have an AMI of 80% to 120%, which means that a person that makes $100,000 can actually apply for this program, which opens the door to a lot of um, different populations because during the pandemic, all people in all brackets were affected uh, financially by this. And this is not about current, this is about back rent. So how do they prove eligibility? So basically the person just have to show their income tax, their pay stops, some sort of document that shows what their income is. And if they don't have anything like that, then they can do a self-attestation, which is a document that they prepare themselves stating how much they make and um, the source of this income and determining the household eligibility the income for everyone in the household above 18 has to be uh, presented however if the 18 year old is in school they don't need to show um, any proof of income one of the very good things about this program is that it does not discriminate against people with um, no immigration status, which helps the a, a whole group of people that are not included. This is great for them because they can apply. If someone in the apartment has a social security card, then they can they can show this. However, if you don't have a social security card at all in the household, you're still good. You can be approved for this and get the help that you need. Um, not not consider income are things like public assistance, any stimulus received during the pandemic, uh, groceries provided by a person not living in the household, uh, HIP benefits. HIP is basically a program that helps people with their electrical bill. So this is a separate program that helps uh, pay for 
electricity. And so all of those things like food stamps, all of those things are not considered to be um, income. So they don't have to, to submit or present this to the application. So the documents that they need, basically ID, social securities, um, if they have birth certificates, at least is very important, and a breakdown. The breakdown is a document that the landlords provide to the tenants, specifying which months um, they owe. And with that, it's crucial to have, because this is going to the, let the city know which months they're paying for, because this is not a free program for the landlords. The landlords have to follow rules. After they accept this money, they have to follow rules. And I'll tell you about these rules in a minute. So the landlords also have documents that they have to provide, like W-9, they have to provide uh, banking information because the money is direct deposited to their accounts. Once the checks are ready, they're directly deposited to the accounts of the landlords. Um, so once the landlords receive the check, they have to abide by certain rules, like they cannot evict the tenants for the months that they have been paid for. They, they cannot, cannot charge, charge them, them for late fees, fees, legal fees, or any other fees. They receive the money, they are counting that as what was owed to them, and that's it. They cannot raise the rent for a year they cannot do it. They have to. They have to follow these rules because if they don't, and they and they take the tenants to court and they show the breakdown that I mentioned before to them, they they have the right to um, appeal what the landlords are saying because of this application and the breakdown that they provided. So a hardship. For this app for to file application for ERAP, you need to declare that you had a hardship. But the hardship doesn't necessarily have to be that you lost employment. It could be that you lost hours from your employment. It could be that the transportation now was so expensive and and you were not able to take trains, so you had to pay for Ubers. And the money for the Ubers or the Lyft you had to take from your um, from your salary, which now stopped you from paying for your rent. Um, it could be that somebody in the household lost employ employment, or they got sick and you have to take care of them and buy PPE and all of those things. The beautiful thing about this is that they're not asking you for proof of any of this. All they're asking you is to state a hardship, and that's basically it. And we always tell our clients, these are the hardships is there any of any of this right here? Did, did you go through that? Okay, so then we mark the one that they said that they did have go to go through. The applications are available 24/7 online, but these applications are not so simple. Um, once you start the application, you cannot go back. If you don't have everything that you need at the moment, you cannot go back. So we always tell people, you have to have everything in front of you because if they ask you for your W-2 information, you have to have it available. If they ask you for your son's social security number, you have to have it available if you have it, if you have one. Um, if they ask you for lease information, when your lease expired, you have to have that because there's no way to go back into the, into the application. Um, the only thing that you can do is submit documents you can do that, but even the documents are in a specific format that you have to submit one by one, and it's not that simple for people to that are not computer savvy or technology savvy to do this, and this is the reason why they took us as one of the two organizations in the Bronx to help with this process. Um, so for people that only want to apply for utilities, there is a whole other application that is not ERAP because for for utilities payments, you have to have both 
rental arrears and utilities arrears. You cannot just apply for uh, utilities, but thankfully there is the HIP program, which is a great program that helps with electricity whenever they need. For people that do their application on their own and let's say they miss up something and they got denied, they can also appeal it, which is a great um, opportunity that they can go in and say, okay, so you're saying that something went wrong. I need to know what can I do to fix that because I really need this. So they provide this information also where you can go ahead and appeal your application. Maybe you put a, a, a date of birth wrong. Maybe a document was missing. Maybe they didn't receive it because imagine the overwhelming amount of applications they're receiving every single day. There are going to be things that are going to be missing and that's not necessarily the tenant's fault. So that is why you have the opportunity to appeal this application denial and, and make things a little easier. So where do we come from? Uh, where do we come in? We help people apply. We help people in this whole process. We help people with beginning the application, doing the whole application for them. Um, we have been very uh, good with remote work and uh, we hired a large team of people to help us apply. Uh, we have a hotline where people can call us and we help them over the phone. We have them fax the paperwork to make sure that, you know, this is all safe for everybody. We want to make sure that we are protecting our clients. They don't have to come to our office, but if they absolutely have to, we do have an office in 12 East Clark Place and another one in 161 where they can go in person with an appointment and get, um, and get service in person. We have a big team working in person, working remote, always making sure that our clients are getting uh, what they need. The application process can be in any level. Let's say that they're in the level of, um, they already did the application, but they don't know how to submit the documents. They need a scanner. So we tell them, okay, well, no issue. Send us everything via email and we will do that for you. Or um, you don't feel comfortable sending your documents over, over uh, uh, email or fax, come into our office, we'll scan these documents for you, we'll make sure that you do it. We also assist them uh, communicate with the landlords. Sometimes these tenants, the landlords, because of the rules that I told you before, have, um, have an issue and they don't wanna do it. So we call these landlords and we tell them, listen, it's easier for you to just accept this because at the end of the day, if you don't accept this money, it's you have to start a court case. The court case is gonna take at least a year for you to be able to get this tenant out. So that's gonna be another year added of rent that you at the end of the day will not get. And you cannot even go through collections to get it at this point. So we talk to them sometimes these landlords are not necessarily computer savvy either and the reason they haven't provided their documents is because they don't know how to do it so we tell them okay well here we're here we're here to assist we're going to help you with this um, bring us the documents or send it to us and we will submit it to the application to make sure that your part is done because at the end of the day what's important for us is that this application is completed and our clients get these payments um, we only service the Bronx. However, there are other organizations in the other boroughs that assist clients uh, with the ERAP program. We tend to get a lot of phone calls because we do a lot of outreaching. So there is a lot of people that come in asking for Manhattan and we say, oh, we can do Manhattan. However, we'll give you the information for Catholic charities and they're great. They'll help you with the process. And if we can consult them so they can do that themselves, we can also do that. And if they call us that they need help with submitting documents, but they don't live in the Bronx, we also help them. Yes. Uh, if somebody start doing the paper work in Bronx, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they move or somewhere like we say, let's go to, to Manhattan and we mm -hmm. have something for you there. To live in Manhattan? Yeah, or oh, in New York City or Brooklyn, there is, 
there is a way that those documents initiated in Bronx can be transferred to another So borough. the debt has to be accrued in the borough that they're doing the application. So let's say they owe a uh, one year worth, worth of rent in the Bronx and then they leave, then they would get the assistance for the year that they owed in the Bronx because now they have like a clean slate in this new apartment. Um, however, that's a good question because this this program is only for back rent. It doesn't help people move. For that, there are other programs that we work with that, that are called city FEPs and FEPs, but I'll get to that in a minute, okay? So one good resource that we always tell people to have is the housing court answers phone number. Because it, this is the main thing that you need, that you need to remember. As from January to now, any applications completed during that time doesn't guarantee payment. The city is fighting, we're fighting right now to get more funding. We really are trying to get more funding, but there is no funds right now available for tenants that applied after January. Um, so the good thing is they get in the protection and two, if there is in the future a re, um, more fundings approved, which is probably gonna happen, they're going to be already in the waiting list and their application may get the funds that, you know, that they need. However, there are so many other resources out there that we have access to and that they have access to. So the housing court answer, if someone needs to get in touch, to get in touch with another charitable organization, they will let them know what they need, if they're eligible, and if they still have funding. Like parts of the solutions, the certain organization that we work with that helps with like a small amount. Let's say somebody owes $5,000 and they get approved for a one shot deal for 4,000. We go, um, our team, uh, goes through other organizations such as PADS and um, Coalition for the Homeless. We also have our own fundings for eviction prevention that we can all put together. Like an organization gives 500, another organization gives 400, and then we give the additional 100 because at the end of the day, what's important for us is to be able to pay it off, the cases discontinue, no risk of eviction at all. So that, so for that, we have, we have other partners that we work with to get this money. And um, housing court answers always have the answer of which organizations still have funding. We also work with Homebase. Homebase is an amazing organization. They have money always. I don't know where they get it from, but they always have. And they have their own qualification process. And, and they have to do their own applications. However, once they are, they have retained us and we are their lawyers, they're good. They, we are, we're in constant communication with the organizations. Um, as I, I don't know if I mentioned before, but every time that one of the, the tenants becomes our client, they're also paired with a case manager. And this case manager helps them with any additional help that they may need, that they may need, like apply, applying for things. Um, we help with communicating. We have already a streamline of communication with directly with HRA and home base and all of the other organizations that we will already have a relationship with. So it's easy for us to be able to um, get things done because we already have a relationship with them. Um, we apply for the FEPS program. The FEPS program is a supplement that not only helps tenants uh, pay back rent, but they also help them monthly uh, based on their income, this program is. The person has to have public assistance and a court case, and we help apply for this program. Oh, and a child under the age of 18, very important, because this is a an assistance for families only. There is another program that's called City FEPS, uh, the same FEPS, but City FEPS, and this is for people that are single, also families, but this is for people that have shelter history. Let's say you have lived in a shelter before, this program will help you pay for 
rent for a few years actually this is actually pretty great and it just went up because you know with the rental rentals go up every year and now it's really high so in order for you to find an apartment it's not going to be within the range that they had before so they raised it like right now for a uh, one person is like i believe 1900 instead of before that was 1400 so where are you going to find an apartment for 1400 so they raised it and for a family of like three for example it's now three thousand which gives the opportunity to people to apply because the Bronx has affordable rent. But if you go to Brooklyn and if you go to Manhattan, the rents are not going to be like that. And there are people that already have their children going to school in these boroughs. And we don't want to move them and, and make their life more uncomfortable. So they raised the standard to make sure that they are accommodating everyone in every world. For the one chat deal, we don't do applications for that. However, we follow up with it. We always tell people to download an app. It's called Access HRA and Access HRA is a great tool. We always tell people, everyone should know about Access HRA. If you have a patient that has an issue, they can always go through there and check on their full stamp cases, their rental, um, their rental, you know, if you have public assistance, you also can have rental assistance and cash assistance. They can always go through that. Even for the Medicaid, they can go through Access HRA. And this is a one-stop shop that HRA has created to make sure that it's easier because not all of their offices are open and they have an overflow of people. So they make sure that they have something accessible where people can just go and access HRA is great. The locations in the Bronx, as you see, are very limited for HRA. So I always tell people, go through Access HRA before you go in person. But there are people who are limited with technology, and um, it's always good to have this. I'm going to send this presentation to you guys so that you have it as well. In the event that you have any questions, you can always go there, but you can always just ask me directly because I'm always available. I swear, I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I'm always I'm always available. Um, our hotline for ERAP is 718-866-0038. And before we had a schedule that was at night and Saturdays, but since there is no funding right now, we cut it back to nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, always someone available. If they don't answer the phone, we always tell people leave a voicemail because someone will get to you, I promise. Or send an email. And then our legal hotline where tenants can access a lawyer for free. This is the number. Um, it's a great tool. I always tell people that some people call and they don't even have housing questions. They have other types of questions. But our lawyers are so good and they've been doing this in different industries so they can answer like any question. I always tell people this is great to have. Have it available if you can because this number can be so helpful and the lawyers do call back if they don't answer the email, they will they will call back in whatever language the person speaks. Uh, we have, we don't have all of the languages in our staff. Uh, we do mainly Spanish, uh, English and French because that's the, the demographics that we service the most. However, we do have a translation service that works with us. So if somebody needs assistance, we don't speak their language. We make sure that we get a translator scheduled to have a call with them so they can understand in their own language what we're trying to say. And then um, if you guys want to learn more about us or uh, for example, I manage our social media and I'm always looking for information and community um, based stuff like jobs, posting, job fairs, all types of events and resources that I can think of. I look for and I put it in our social media so that people can be aware of resources and things that they can do to get assistance because I think it's important and, and we also have all the resources from our shelters, for example, if you guys send us an event that's going on 
we put it in the site so that the community knows that you guys are hosting an event that that you guys have this one resource available for people and 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 all of our partnerships we make sure that we put it together and we put this information in our site to make sure that the community is aware of everything that's going on how to protect themselves because we are all about the community <laughs> and that's my presentation um, do you guys have any questions Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question well, online. Uh, oh. I'd like to really thank you. This was very informative. This is Dr. Aribi. Um, I wanted to request if this could be put in a cheat sheet, the numbers, the you know, the numbers for the housing court, your number, um, you know, the NICA information hotline and website and your number. And um, I think that was another one um the legal hotline the legal this hotline. Is very useful information um we've come across different patients at different times in need of these services and the best we can ever do is to make a care coordinator a case manager referral and i sometimes it gets through and sometimes we don't hear back and we don't know what the outcomes are but this seems like very useful information so if we could have this condensed into some kind of cheat sheet and sent out to everyone, all the physicians in the primary care services, I think it would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. I will make sure that you guys are receiving everything. Uh, this this uh, presentation slides and I'm also going to create a flyer actually for you guys that is going to have all of those phone numbers all together and that will be like a one-stop place where you can just get everything and I will have that ready. I'm going on vacation on Friday, <laughs> but uh, I will have that ready. How about when I come back from vacation that, that week of the six? No worries. For you guys. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll bring print copies so that you can have it in your clinics. And if you have any questions, also, my information because as i said i'm always available and you guys can reach to me and also clients your 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 um tenant I mean, your patients mm -hmm. i i guess so many <laughs> clients residents tenants uh you can always refer them directly to me too and and i will make sure that they get the guidance that they need great thank you and uh dr on yes or work with and Bertha. That's our um, main um, basically resource we use and with me. So so yeah, so this is one of the important things that we're uh, and and um, it's a sneak peek for uh, some of the uh, physicians on the line. So we have a program that we uh, have launched mainly with care coordination team, but we want to launch also with the clinical team. It's called UCHC Bronx Healthy. It's through a platform called Fine Health Aunt Bertha. Um, it's similar to NowPow, if anybody's uh, familiar with NowPow. But what we're doing is that we are partnering with these organizations, making sure they're on the platform. And that's another way that we can have favorite lists for all the providers that if you want to look for housing or food pantries or, um, you know, daycare services or after school activities, that we have little folders with partners that we already have a good relationship with that will be easy for you to find. Because I know a lot of times um, these emails or these flyers get lost after yeah. some time so but so. this will be a platform online that that is actually connected with athena so that's another good thing um you log on to athena we're working on all the details um you log on to athena and you can access this platform and then once the platform you're in the platform you could you know print this out for your um patients or can and in the future or very soon do a direct referral through through the platform and you could see how everything's going. So that's a little preview, but yes, 
we're working with all these organizations. We're, we're going to work with you to make yeah, sure. We would love to be part of that. Yes. And be a rental assistance, legal assistance um, partner that can provide this help. Because I think a lot of people more than ever needs this, need this. Yes. And these resources, I think this is great that your organization works hard to make sure that the community have access to other resources that means that you care and we are so proud to be able to work with an organization that actually thinks that way because health is not only physical health is everything and within that affecting this these people so this is so great that you guys are not only worried about the healthcare but also looking at all their resources as part of their health and and providing that to them that's amazing i'm so excited to work with you yes we're really trying because like as you mentioned we really know that healthcare goes beyond our our clinic doors and a lot of the stressors that our patient has on the top of the list is housing and food so we're trying to really yes. do an effort to you know uh break those barriers and and hopefully they could focus more on their care and yes. less stress. I know um, I know. probably all of you have had examples of this in your practice and um, any, any other questions or comments or anything that you might think of that can help us yes. in the process. Any questions that you may have also you can uh, directly, I don't know if you can see my, um, my, yeah. There. My information is is uh oh. I don't know why. Oh, just uh, hold on. Oh, well, I'm not sure. Too sure. I think that um on the presentation. I think we stopped sharing or something. Maybe. Bloop bloop. Oh. Nope, no secure mode. Um, but my information, Miss Muniz has it. She has it. You can always reach out to me if you have any questions. Something that you cannot think about right now, and in in a few days it it gets to you. You can always reach out to me. I will make sure that you get your assistance. I was a paralegal for ten years. Um, so I know a lot about housing. I'm always taking uh, webinars and learning new things. However, if I don't know something because because I'm not uh, a lawyer, I will make sure that you get access to a lawyer that knows how to get you the help for your tent, for your uh, patient. All right, and thank you everyone. And I want to um, just do a quick announcement. I want to thank, uh, of course, Epifania and everybody for joining. But I also want to introduce one of our new providers, our internal medicine, uh, Dr. Um, Aravachi. Welcome to the UCHC team. And he's internal medicine and also has a background in nephrology. So if we have any questions of nephrology we have an expert in the room so thank you it's a pleasure to meet you in person and uh, thank you all for coming and see you next month thank you so much for coming to this presentation and for listening to these resources uh, my name is Epi Adames. I am the Assistant Director for the Community Affairs Department at Neighborhood Association for Little Cultural Affairs and if you need assistance, you can always reach out to me and I will make sure that you get connected to uh, one of our team members. Thank you.